Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so um, I'd like to introduce David Socha, um, a friend of mine who's a professor at University of Washington at Bothell, which is pretty close by here at Microsoft. Um, David uh, has a long history in many different fields, uh, including zoology, uh, where he learned all about observation, I'm sure, and um, then spent uh, almost 20 years as a software engineer in industry and uh, before becoming a professor at uh, University of Washington teaching software engineering and computer science. And uh, David has really, really cool ideas um, integrating social theory with um, stuff we know about software engineering teams. And uh, today he's going to be talking about a vision he's got of how software engineering could be studied in the future using uh, lots and lots and lots of cameras and ethnography and maybe some automated analyses. So I will give you David. Thanks. <laughs> So is everybody going to record this on their cameras? And then we have all these streams of data, and we can analyze it and spend time doing that at the end of the talk. So I saw people taking the cameras out. OK. Um, so thank you for coming. Thank you for having me here. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, this is work that actually started probably four years ago, though it has longer history behind it. The wide field ethnography stuff came from a collaboration with a bunch of people at different disciplines and in different institutions, uh, including Skip Walter, who's at the back there. And three, some of my grad students are walking in the door at the back here. So what I want to do is actually tell you the background. Where did this thing come from? What does it actually mean to be able to do this type of thing? And what are the implications for us and our colleagues in our discipline and other disciplines? So it really started because I had spent that 19 years after getting my PhD at University of Washington, Seattle. I was in industry. Good to see you again. Um, and and I had been in places like this, where they're doing software development. And this happens to be an organization that does a lot of agile software development practices. And so they're pair programming and things like that. So I was in places like this. And I was really interested in collaboration. And now I was in academia at University of Washington Bothell. And so I need to figure out, what am I going to do for research? Because this is tenure track. If I don't do the research, it's not going to work. And I'd been in industry for a long time. So I was very interested in the practitioner world. I was more interested in the practitioner world and what the experts do in their highly contextual environment than in the controlled design experiments with control groups and in the laboratory or studies about students. All good stuff. This is where my interest lay. So I was trying to figure out how to actually get into this space. And because of some work that I had done with Skip Walter, who is in the back here, and other people, I also really wanted to use video to help the ethnographic inquiry into the nature of collaboration in these types of organizations. So, um, so one, one of the first things I did is I looked around. I found an organization. Turns out to be this one. We use the name Beam Coffer. It's a pseudonym to refer to this organization. And I actually got permission to come in here and do some ethnographic video type, uh, video ethnography type work. And so I came in here, and I had a single camera on my first day looking around to see what actually I might be able to do. Um, and one of the first days, I actually videoed some of the people who were up in this little place just for a half an hour, just to get the idea of what does this actually mean? What type of video is going to work? How much video do I need to get? What are the positions? The type of things that always you have to address when you're doing video in workplaces or in other settings. And that actually, just that 15 minutes of video actually turned out to be quite useful. Um, we actually could discern some things about awareness and how people might transition between the awareness that there's sort of my awareness of myself and the environment to our joint awareness. So uh, from I awareness to we in awareness. And that was really good and got a nice paper, actually a couple of papers out of that. But I, I only saw this tiny little bit of the environment. I couldn't see the voices from behind. I couldn't see the larger scope of the social environment of what's going on here. So I actually went back later, and I really was curious. I had noticed that these people who are at these pair programming stations, two keyboards, two mice, one computer, um, they're often not just two people. 
sometimes there'd be three people or four people, and they're talking back and forth and all that stuff. And practitioners know that that's what happens in here, but the, the literature said almost nothing about these interactions outside of just the two people of the pair, which was sort of surprising. So I went back with four cameras and set them up on either side of the two pairing stations on the left side of this desk to gather more widely, to be able to see who was sitting behind these people and what the gestures were and things like that. And that actually was useful in that it, we could then evidence that these people weren't just talking between the two people. They were talking across the table and the, the work was organically growing and shrinking as needed and sometimes there are two pairs involved in the same work. And we actually found out that about 20% of the time, they're not just, they're, they're interacting with people outside of the pair. So that was useful from an academic perspective to say, huh, if we really want to study organizations like this, instead of focusing just on our particular unit analysis, two people, maybe we need to broaden the scope, gather more widely to see the context in which those two people are actually working. And so, and, I, and that was good with the four cameras, but I couldn't see who they're talking to on the other side. So it's still limiting. And they were talking to people on the other side. And I couldn't see what the gaze was and gestures. So I went back later, about a year later, in um, 2014 with more cameras. But before I get to that, here's what I'm really doing, right? I'm an academic. I'm in a research environment. I'm trying to do research. I'm trying to have new discoveries of information. And I'm trying to actually, in the end, impact this practice scope. There are software engineers out there, and they do amazing things, and they create amazing systems. Yes, this is adapted from Gail Murphy's ICSI keynote last week or a week, as, week and a half ago. Um, so I want these inventions, and, and ideally, I would like to actually impact the practice. That is the sort of holy grail of research, to come up with theories and insights so that these people doing this really interesting and complicated and complex work can actually do it even better. So that's what I wanted to do. And so I went back in here, and I wanted to attend to all of these physical and cyber and social aspects of what's going on here, because people are sitting side by side. They have all these materials of design on their desk. They can look across to the people on the other side. They have the laptops, they have the, the mobile devices, they have the code repositories, the task tracking systems. They have all of these materials of design, and how could I gather all that? So I went in with nine GoPro cameras, six Zoom high-quality audio recorders, um, and, uh, and also some observations, and a handheld camera, and some screen capture. And so what we see here, this table here, is this table right here. So, these two people are pairing at this location right here. And there's another pairing station up here. So we have seven pairing places where people pair in this organization. And I put GoPro cameras in blue recording video next to these. And they have a 170 degree field of view so I could gather more widely. Uh, so I have some of those. I also have one that they could just wander with to take other rooms. Um, I had one hanging with a microphone hanging on the ceiling up here so I could see them as they're doing their huddles in this area three times a day and gather that. I also had a one, these cameras only record about six and a half hours. Tom, so, or? I have two questions. Yeah. Maybe them, but like, they're totally cool with you just like being big brother. Do you have a pre-existing relationship with these people? Is this like where you worked before? Okay. So I have read stuff and so after this, I reached out to, so this in case, yes, I had a pre-existing relationship with one of the people there. Later, I was wanting to get more sites that I might be able to gather from, so I actually reached out to about 50 organizations. Six of those said yes. Three of those were pretty weak yeses. They were consulting organizations. They do some work in-house, but some with other people. Would they actually be able to get permission with those other people? Not clear. And then... Um, two, three of them were actually pretty rich. There's one international, well-known organization that does agile software development really, really well, and they were willing for me to come in and do some of their open source projects. So yes, there is this issue, and this is not necessarily what you have to do for wide field ethnography. I'll get to it. 
in the, the best world, you have all of the scope that these people have. They're here in this amazingly rich environment that is seamless. They can turn the head, they can listen, they can perceive where the voice is coming from, they can go into the machines, and ideally, as a researcher, you'd have all of that available to you. And then, of course, there's the pragmatics, and you gather as much as you can, and sometimes you can't gather what you want. Does that? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the stuff isn't just limited to here. It does actually span a broader scope, which will make it more accessible to more people doing more types of studies. Do they have the ability to turn it off when sensitive things came up? In, they do. They could just walk up to the camera and turn it off. In this case, I had an agreement that I was, uh, so I, the consent agreement here um, is that if they ever want to not allow me to use that data in the future at any point, they can send me a letter and I will then delete all that data. Oh, so you still still you already have it. Yeah. I have six terabytes of data from 11 days. So what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is you have the recorded the recorded private conversations, and then you delete them not, like after they ask you to. So they don't have the option to turn but, but it off. But I think you said they, they, you, they can turn it off if they want to. They have the cameras there, and they can turn them off. OK? They never did. Okay. They never even seemed to care when I was there, per just personally or with the other cameras. There are actually studies showing that the cameras sort of disappear from your awareness if you're actually doing your work. You ignore them pretty quickly, especially when they're GoPros that are really tiny, and they're on a tiny little tripod. And so the most obvious thing is the blue painter's tape that's holding the tripod in place so it doesn't get swatted away accidentally. Um, so, and in this case, the consent agreement allows me to share this data with other research groups as well, as long as they abide by the same constraints about privacy and confidentiality. Um, yeah, so does that address your questions? Yes. Thank you for asking this. So I went in here, uh, there's also a time lapse. So here you can see, this is every five seconds, the entire room. So you can actually see where people are, even if they're outside of the cameras. This is the type of video you get, 1280p from the rooms where they're doing sketching. They took it to another room over here. This is the ceiling image um, that was taking a snapshot of the whiteboard. This is the huddles going on here. And this is the type of stuff you get from the pairing stations, OK? And other questions bubbling there. So just a comment. Like, I realize when you're doing ethnography, right, you're wanting to get all this data. But I look at this, and I see 11 days of this, and I say, OK, at the end of that time, you have like, I don't even know how many streams of video. And now you have to do something with it. You have to like code it. You have to analyze it. You have to look for things. Like, yep. that makes my head hurt. <laughs> right. How, so I, are you, I you going to get to that? I'll like, get how to that. You, OK. I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> so, so the fact that you began this and you did so, it's like super impressive to me, because I would just be like, oh, it's information overload. Yes. Yes, and there, so there, there's multiple ways in there, and I'll get to the multiple ways. Okay. And if I don't, then call me back to it and say, where were the multiple ways, Sosha? OK, right. sweet. Great. So what we discovered getting all this data is that we could actually do some really interesting things. Because we gathered so widely, we could actually follow work across space and time. Somebody would make a mark, we'd see a mark on a whiteboard, and we'd say, who wrote that? And we could go back three days and find out who wrote it on the whiteboard. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool. We could see that the work that started at one parent station, they had conversations, now is at two, and then went over to another one. And so now there's six people involved. This is interesting. Um, we also, it, there's so much richness in here with all this unstructured video and audio that we can support lots of different types of research questions from different disciplines about different types of things using different types of units of analysis. So it could be the person, it could be the place, it could be the pair, it could be the task, it could be the, um, the, the role, lots of different things going on here. It could be the source code. Well, and this is, again, because it could do that, it actually would really afford these communities of researchers working collectively together using all of the different perspectives to come up with much more interesting analyses. And I've been involved in some of these workshops where you have a joint data set like this with video, and you'll have 50 people from mechanical engineering, design studies, education, ethnography, or uh, sociology, anthropology, and so on, all coming together to do a joint analysis. 
you could do that with this, and there would be so much that different people could attend to, power structures and so on. It also allows me to do what I've been trying to do. I can wild my observational view, field of view. I can follow those things across here. And it also means that I can go in there with an assumption of what's going on, and I can gather so much data that I can, uh, come on. Like Thank you. Refute my assumption. I go, oops. But if I just gathered five hours of video, there's much less chance of actually finding the data that we refute my conjectures, my hypotheses, my assumptions. And interestingly, perhaps most interestingly to me, it really allows the researcher to span a multiple of different ways of approaching research. They can have the design, the, the scientific method where you come up with a design study and you figure out what data is to be included and then you go in here as if you were walking in there in real life and just look, attend to that data and do your analysis. You don't quite have the control study. But you can also go to the things where, huh, I'm interested in this space. What's going to come out? And so as you go through there, there in interaction analysis, which sociologists use and Lucy Suchman and such have used, you actually will often look at the videos and just make a high level notation about, ooh, minute 10, that was an interesting power dynamic. Ooh, minute 15, look at how the work is being negotiated and the problems are being made in the conversation. And so you can just scan through this and then find the stuff that, oh, this keeps on coming up. Huh, I never would have known about that. So it's a complex system, and you can see the emergent patterns that no one had even thought of going and investigating. And those insights can then drive the more standard scientific method type inquiry, or you can go and mine the data set to find an evidence in, in post hoc Say, huh, we have this two by two matrix with two dimensions, plus and minus, plus and minus. We see this thing here. Can we get half a dozen representations in these four boxes? And if you do that, you can actually start reasoning fairly strongly about what is the nature of work and how these dimensions are related to the things going on. So that looks interesting. Um, and so we realized that it wasn't just, we weren't here anymore. We were in a broader space. We actually had this thing where we were gathering so widely using ethnographically informed practices that we actually started suspecting this might be different, qualitatively different from going in with one or two or three cameras or spending months on site. Not necessarily better or worse, just different. And we started wondering what that might be. And as you pointed out, oh my goodness, there are tools needed to actually keep us sane and to make this something that people can actually want to do and do effectively without wasting their time on all of these things. And I'll get to some of those things. So given that, and one of the, sorry, one of the other big things we realized, and this is the sociologists talk about the context is key to reading the text. So if somebody says a particular word, if they're saying, oh, this, this, and this, and if all you have is the audio, you see this, this, and this, but if you have the video, you can see them pointing at this, this, and this, and realize that those three words are completely different things. The word, the meaning of the word is not derived from the dictionary. It's derived from its use in the social environment in which it's being used. And so all of these types of context really help you see cognition in action, because cognition is not just this thing that the cognitists talk about. It's in our bodies. It's in the materials of design that are around our spaces that we refer to as the gestures, as the gaze, all of that stuff is used very effectively by humans. We've been evolved to do that. So this addresses what Peggy Story talked about in a recent um, ACM SIGSOFT webinar last month, where you get all this big data, you get all these digital streams of information that really look so promising, and if you only have that stream of the audio or you only have the commit messages, you're missing so much of the context. So Peggy talks about how you need the thick data to inform the big data. You basically want, if you want to look at the, the social life of a bug, for instance, you want all that social data to inform how bugs are socially created. What's the social influence on bugs? What's the influence of bugs on social, on social situations. 
So that's what we did here. And in thinking about this more, there's actually four things we really want to attend to. The physical, how are we using our bodies? The cyber, all these tools. The social, all of the norms of behavior and the ways we interact. And really, it better be economic too. Because any system, if it's going to live long enough, needs to have some sort of business model that actually has enough value propositions and value exchanges to sustain that business model. Whether that's monetary exchanges or social capital exchanges or whatever, for things to survive, they need an economic base. They need the viability. So really, we think of these things as physical, social, economic cyber systems, or PSEX, which has this lovely property that you can stick it right into the word, or pull it out of the word presence, because that's really what it is about we as humans. We are present in an environment. We're present in a situation. And that presence allows us to understand what's going on and act in that. So in some sense, wide-field ethnography is how do we understand what presence means with respect to software development, for instance? And this is a little uh, assertion from Christiana Floyd. Software development is an organizational intervention. We're creating software systems, and most of those we want to people to use, and they're not actually using the thing we haven't created yet. So we need to figure out how to intervene into the social system of that person to make them use the thing that they aren't using now. We have to do this intervention, which means it's about psychology now, which also means that not only is the software development organization a PSEC, a physical, social, economic, cyber system, but the systems we create themselves are also PSECs. The software we create is used by people, and it has to have an economic base to actually sustain itself. It gets involved in the social fabric. It is involved in cyber, because we're computer science software developers. And there's some connection to the physical world. Otherwise, we can't ever perceive it. And therefore, it essentially doesn't exist if there's not some eventual connection to the physical world. So this is one, in some sense, what we're trying to do here is how do we get enough context so we don't end up in the light post or the light street light effect, where we're looking for the interesting stuff where we have the data, but we might not actually be looking in the right place. It's just where we happen to have the data. And that's the goal of wide field ethnography. And it has issues like this. So that one collection, 45 streams of data, if you think about the video and the left and right stereo and the screen capture and the other, cam other types of cameras, which result in six terabytes, which is a lot. It's a mess. Um, so you need some sort of system, some sort of tooling system. This is a very high level perspective. Um, you've got all of these streams of data come in from different types of media, video, audio, and so on. You might have some sort of psychometric or physiological data from a Fitbit in there. You might have documents that are put into some sort of repository on the system or physical documents that are sitting on the table. So you have all this stream of information that comes into this data set. And yes, and, and some of it's very unstructured, and some of it's quite structured. And the community, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to span both of these communities, and I actually am in my work. Over here, we have people who use the interaction analysis. So this gets back to your question again, where those people don't watch all 380 hours of video. They'll watch a few hours, and then they'll be sufficiently pulled toward one inquiry that they go study that. But it would be really nice if they find some thing of interest. Let's say the laughter is a moment of interest, because when somebody, person A says something and person B says something, it's like, wait a minute, those can't be at the same time, the same place. It, and then you suddenly realize that, oh, yes, they can. Then there's this thing called incongruity resolution theory that says that you'll get this burst of humor, which almost very often results in laughter. And then you can attend to what they're saying and saying be not just the verbal, but the body and the gestures and gaze. And you can listen to them reconceiving the nature of their work from before the incongruity resolution to after it. That's sort of interesting. So if you're starting to think the laughter is interesting, how could we write one of these algorithms?
to find all the laughter in here so that I can actually effectively get to those pieces. So I can then analyze that five seconds or 15 seconds spending you know, half an hour or an hour or two on 10 seconds of data. And that's typically what we'll do. We spent one, uh, I'll get to it. So, and we actually wrote that algorithm, by the way, and it's coming out in a paper um, in a couple months. And if you want, I can send, Andy has a copy of it. Or you can, you can email me and I'll send you a copy. And I actually did really, really good work by, there's a microphone hanging from the ceiling up here. And in the huddles, in this noisy naturalistic environment, the student actually got really good accuracy and recall compared to all the other studies with data like this. Um, and so we now, now have another student who is actually taking that algorithm and putting it up into the cloud next to all of our data so we can run across all that data and actually get to those moments so we can do more inquiry. So we, both sides of these things are useful. And the question is, how can we support both sides? Um, and it's, that's the problem, right? Because you have all these streams of data, and now it's a mess. You've taken this coherent whole, and you've fractured it into all these streams of data, which have just a part of what's going on. And now they're dis dissociated with each other. And you need to put them together in a way so I, as a researcher, can get back into this and actually navigate and find things. And it turns out to be a pain in the neck if you don't have the tools. And it's the, the reality I've been living in for two years. Um, so here's one thought. You can think of the streams as collaborating. Each stream has some data. And they certainly collaborate ac across time. They are recorded in some sort of universal time. And you can also imagine they collaborate according to location. They also, you can imagine tagging these things for laughter, and now you can collaborate by laughter. You can imagine a machine algorithm that would go through and do facial recognition and find where Bob is, and now they collaborate by person, and so on. So there's lots of different ways you could tag these things manually or automatically and get correlations so you, now you can jump from one place to another place through this thing. What time is it? Okay. Um, and some of these streams, a stream itself, so this is an audio stream. This is a sort of funny paper that Michael Roth wrote a few years, or last year, where he found this word penis used 10 times in a uh, high school physics class. And none of the references of penis are actually to the organ. They're all just part of this game, and they all mean something different. But the point here is that, so that's funny. This is those 10 instances of that word. And they, one stream of audio has been dissociated into one, two, three, four, five different substreams. So streams have a life of their own. You can pull them apart into other streams. You can merge streams into a different stream. It's not as simple as, as this diagram represented. And, it's, and we don't, you know, these video cameras, they're really cool. But you, anybody watch the Super Bowl? You saw how they froze the action and they zoomed in with the voxel space they created. So that's what Replay Technologies did. They have a bunch of high resolution cameras around some sort of sport event. And then they stream those in real time up to a bunch of servers. And then they create voxel space so you can freeze it. And with the Microsoft Surface Pro, you can then go in and control your angle and move around as you want and zoom in and then play the video from that angle, that perspective. So that's the, what the CEO of Intel was talking about in this video on January 5th. They bought that company since then. Why would they want to buy that company? Nobody wants their chips. <laughs> <laughs> Probably lots of chips being used to do that type of thing. So if you can drive this type of thing, you might drive some chips sales, OK? There's a lot of data involved with this. Um, and furthermore, software development is a team sport. So I would, as a researcher, love to be able to jump into Beam Coffer, sit where Andy, let's say Andy works at Beam Coffer, sit where he's sitting, looking at his screen, and then play the world, hearing what he hears out of his left ear and what of the right ear. Sorry, not knowing your characteristics if you're hearing of your internal organs, but what you might be able to perceive and see and then be able to dive in to that screen 
and look at the source code repository and the task tracking system and analyze what he's actually working on, and then jump back out and move around. And I'd then like to be able to go sit on Marcy's seat across Mandy and see what she can see. And so I can get telepresence, because I can go back to the same place in many different perspectives, looking at the data again and again until I see a new coherent whole that is something that wasn't there before. That's sort of cool. That's the type of thing that these things allow that you can't get with a person doing the standard ethnographic practices. Um, and it gets even more, oh, you know, of course you had want the virtual reality headset on here, right, to really get the presence of it. Um, and it gets more interesting because there are at least two organizations, Magic Leap and Envelope VR, who are developing these types of technologies, who are they're claiming that in the next year they're going to have their software developers start building the environments with these things on their head. So they're going to use virtual reality to create software systems, to create PSEX. What does that mean? How do we collect the data about those things? How do we understand that? Because what Andy sees in his headset may be different from what I see in my headset, even though we think we're in the same co-located space, because he's got an extra couple of screens up here, and I've got some different screens over here. So now we need to record all this stuff, and it gets so the, the tool problem gets worse. Well, what was the chicken? <laughs> <laughs> Envelope VR has some crazy people doing interesting artwork. What can I say? It was from their website. Um, so 2014, yeah, six terabytes. It's a pain in the neck. It's doable. You can imagine that in nine years or so, it might be more like 4,000 streams. It might be more like petabytes because of all of these extra streams of information and the higher resolution stuff. Whoa. There's a problem here, which means there's an opportunity here, right? Because, boy, this stuff is data hungry. Where are they going to store the data? Where are the software services going to be that actually can do the machine learning to analyze the data to find those tags so you can correlate the streams and recreate a coherent whole that is novel for the researcher and more insightful? That's, so there's, there's needs to store the data. There's needs to analyze this massive quantities of data. There's needs to share the data. There's all sorts of stuff. So that's sort of the vision, and I'm going to go back to a little bit about problems we're dealing with today to get some concrete types of problems, and then we'll go back to the bigger vision thing. So here's something that we were doing the other day. We were watching this video, and then this person up here all of a sudden says something, and they're looking across the camera. It's like, oh man, who are they talking to? Well, how today do I figure out who they're talking to? Well, I look at the map. OK, they're in Perrin Station A. So they're looking across to Perrin Station C. So then I open up the browser, and I was up over here, and then I have to, the Windows Explorer, and then I go over here, and then I find out which video, and then I open the video, and of course they're not synchronized. Uh, and it's not, I don't care about video files, I care about time. Why is this abstraction of files in my face? Not helpful. So then I have to actually find the correlations. This is 04 and this is 0. I mean, they're a few seconds off. And then I have to find the right place. And now I can actually see that these two of these people, I blur their faces, but they actually are looking across here. This person's looking here. It seems. It looks like it is. They're attending in that direction. And I can listen to it, but of course I want to play them together. And I actually can't play them together because they're two separate files and the system doesn't do that. And really, I don't want to listen to the GoPro audio because it's, it's Good, but it's not great. There's this high resolution audio recorder here, and there's one here. I want to listen to that in my left stereo, listen to that in my right stereo, and play these things synchronously by frame, fast forward, reverse, and so on. That's what I want to do. And it's not technically difficult. These are all straightforward things, but these things don't quite live yet. And so my students and I live in that pain. And this is a variety of other pain points. We want to tell the story about the amazing results we can find. That's what we want to do. But we have to start off gathering the data. We have all this equipment. This is just the beam coffer stuff, all a dozen hard drives to keep all the data. We have to deploy them and 
upload the data, which meant until 10 p.m. every night I was uploading through my two hard drives via my laptop until I actually got a second way to do it, and now it was done at 8.30 p.m., which was fantastic. Um, and then, oh, there's, we have to correct it because, oh, I mislabeled a file, a folder the other day, so where's the data for the 22nd? It's like, oops, it's in the 21st. Oh, oops. So, and you have to clean things up, and it's all that mess. And then you have to do all this stuff to find the stuff that you care about and to navigate through the system and to filter out so you can just focus on a little bit and do the analysis, not on everything, but just on the little bit that matters because it takes a while or costs money to do an analysis. Even if it's automated, you spend money on the CPU. And then you get stuff that's more useful. This is grunt work. You really want this to be instantaneous. And now you're actually viewing it, but that's useful if you're exploring. And you're annotating, and it, that's slightly painful, but it's useful. And then you get into the analyze. It's like, OK, yeah, this is where I wanted to start. And I had to go through all this stuff. And we're generating hassle maps of all of the impediments to get there. And it's, it's, it's a pain in the neck. It takes half an hour to do that thing I just talked about before right. in that particular case, because I hadn't been with that files for a long time and couldn't remember where they were and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and we also, of course, want to share this stuff with other people. And we want to use visualizations across this whole stack because we are visual creatures and they help us do things better. And then there's the issue of, am I doing this by myself or am I doing this with a group of people? Am I collectively analyzing or doing it by myself? Different affordances wanted in different places. So we have all these hassles and we need those tools. Oh boy, we need those tools. And we're starting to build the tools and we need them sooner than that. That's what I'd like. One thing to note here is you can use this at lots of scale. So Blink, one of our collaborators, Kelly Franznick, started creating a system around the same time I was doing my Beam Coffer stuff to instrument a room where they're doing user experience research. So they had multiple cameras. Those feeds would go into a control room where they'd blend them into one video. That would then go up into the cloud and then be redeployed into another room where is the, the person at Blink who's running this user research and the, the clients would be there. And then there's another room in other places around, you know, like other countries, where people are also viewing those videos in real time, near real time, and they're chatting with a chat feature back and forth, making sense of the data, and actually changing the user experience research process in the, on the fly, because they realize, oops, that's not working. Oh, there's something more important to discuss. So they actually never, almost never look at the videos afterwards, because that live, in-person, collective sense-making in near real time is actually good enough. Enough value right there. So you could do that. It's just small little things. You could do what I did. But boy, if I did this again in a couple of years, I'd want to go in there with enough cameras to make that voxel space, collecting all the digital trails I can imagine, having Fitbits or something like that, to really have EEGs. Can you actually detect? team flow, okay? Be interesting to find out. If you detect team flow, what are the social or physical or in cyber th or economic things that might disrupt team flow or that create team flow and so on? Yeah. Um, so here's another thing. So there, this Beam Coffee data set, we took it up to University of Washington, or with University of Victoria, Vancouver Island, Michael Roth's office. So there's Michael Roth. Skips in the other room using the system that Blink made. So he can watch us through some cameras like this one that are streamed up to the web. And then he's making little annotations as he's watching this whole thing. And then there's Josh Tenenberg, Robin Adams, um, and Alfredo Jornet and I. And we're in here, and we're watching this. And we played five, we'd already watched six hours of video before we came here to the stream of stuff. We watched about five seconds, and we spent two hours discussing five seconds. It started off, the first five seconds, the people said, what do you mean by scalability? And then about an hour into this, and we're talking about previous things and looking at other pieces of video, somebody, we're in this group, and somebody points to the other person, what, what do you mean by scalability? At which point, half of it just crack up. We had, because we were collectively analyzing this, 
we had just recreated the social phenomenon that we were actually trying to investigate. So now as researchers, we could actually experience it as well as observe it. We could almost be participant observers, observers in this space by having a set of multiple people. So we actually came up with this thing, you know, spiders have multiple eyes. In some sense, what is this superorganism? What is having six different eyes with different perspectives and different agendas going on at the same time allow? What does it afford? How is this different from just one person working by themselves? So we're looking into this some more. Um, and, and this is the sort of the system I'm playing in today. So we're getting close to the end of this. Um, there is this beam coffer data set that I have collected. Other people are collecting others. Robin Adams at University of Washington Bothell. She's a education professor, and she's really interested in STEM education. And it turns out that pre-calculus classes are a problem because people go in there and they get discouraged and they drop out of the STEM path. So how can we keep people in the STEM path? Well, it turns out active learning is really good at that. But what is it about active learning? And there's not a lot of data around that. So she started collecting data set of group work in pre-calculus classes at UW Bothell. And if her plans came to fruition, she would have thousands of hours of this video. Tool problem. They're education people. They're not software developers. They're not going to be able to make much traction. The mess gets so messy so quickly. Um, then there's a, building these tools. Um, so one a tool in the back here, she's actually looking at what does it mean to do wayfinding in these types of data sets. It's not just about search and finding. How do you find your way, either when you don't even know what you're looking for or what you do know what you're looking for? Um, there's also, uh, let's see, who else is there? Um, Fida in the back here is looking at visualizations. How can visualizations help those different points in the stack? Hassett's saying, huh, what if we had a 3D, 360 degree camera? How might that afford different ways of experiencing and being present as a researcher than if you have these flat screens that we normally are interacting with through video? So there's all that stuff. And then we're trying to do some, there's more work we're doing analyzing that data set. And there are other people in uh, Europe, UK, Canada, US who are um, either in or going to go soon get into the data set as soon as I can get enough tools for that to be a sustainable activity. So I, you may have already mentioned it. Are you looking at ways of like annotating yeah, we're data actually, from all streams, like saying this thing happened here right. and like tagging it like you would tag like an interview transcript or something, but in this. And the annotations can do done with machine learning algorithms, or there's a system out of University of Wisconsin Madison called Transena that's been around for about 15 years. It's used pretty widely. And we have a copy of that. We're starting to integrate that into our tool system. And it allows you to play four or five media streams concurrently, forward and backward, and annotate. And it supports different annotation formats. And you can, so it does a bunch of that stuff. And it also has a shared database so that as you're annotating and I'm annotating in different places, I can see your annotations in real time. So there's support for the collective inquiry. And instead of building that, we're just integrating that. Um, and then there's this, what does it mean to actually do this? How, and we can use this not only to understand what wide field ethnography means, but we can actually use it to do the design experiments, deploy a visualization. How does that change the hassle map? Does it mean that they can get to the value they want sooner? How does we change some of the wayfinding stuff? What's the benefit to the people? So that's the system that I'm playing in at this point. Um, and it's not that we're new, doing new stuff. This long pedigree of using video in different discourses for trying to figure out what's going on from the, the people looking at copy machines all the way up to education and computer-supported cooperative learning and so on. And, and this, a lot of this focuses on that slow reading of the unstructured data so you can see the new insights that can generate opportunities for machine learning. Um, so here's the summary of it now. What we, this is where... We, so we, we, last time we looked at this, we have the research, we have the practice. And really, what I want to do is I want to push these tools up here into practice so that I can take them back here and actually use them to do this type of work. Right? Without those tools, it's going to be too painful. But it's more than this. 
there's a lot of other discourses, disciplines, that do video. And they have these same problems. So they rarely take more than a couple of video cameras out there. So sociology, education, computer-supported cooperative work, computer-supported cooperative learning, there's lots of work in there on this stuff and others. How can these tools actually help them do their research? So what, is there anything in particular to so the software engineering, engineering domain that you're like specific to your, your tooling and the problem you're trying to tackle? I mean, it seems like what, what you're trying to do in the data you're capturing would be true of any kind of business collaborative knowledge worker setting. Is there, is there anything SE specific here? Uh, it was motivated because we do use a lot of digital tools. That's pretty much the case for all, most disciplines now. So I think that the software engineering still has a really rich place because we use them and we make them and we modify them to a degree that other people don't. So we're leading in a lot of these areas. But if you look at these other things, we might get some interesting insights about, oh, that's an interesting way of doing it or a different tool that actually could also, that's what these lines are for. It could be that when we look over here, we say that could be useful for our software developers or up here. So I hadn't thought about that. So there's lots of feedback possibilities in here because we are people and we use physical stuff and social stuff and cyber stuff in many different places. So I don't think, I think there's, in the broad view, it's useful so many places. There's nothing special about software development. It's just we're at the forefront of a lot of these things. And we, if we start using them, might make our own dog, eat our own dog food, whatever you want to call that thing. We know how to make these tools. So this community would further this faster than just deploying it over here. Um, so this gets to the next part. These, all of these communities want to eventually affect practice. Most people do. That's a common thing. To get that to happen, it's not just going to be research results here we actually probably need to commercialize that thing. We need to make this thing substantial enough, easy enough to use, robust enough, scaling well enough that people could use it with these petabyte types of data sets that are coming down the pipe. And that is my sort of long vision at, the point, at this point. So that's wide field ethnography. We're doing this really wide data collection to give you this context so you can understand these things better, design them better, improve these PSEX, as we call them down here. Questions? Yes? So there's, I love this vision. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to picture in my mind's eye it's 50 years from now. This vision has been completely worked out, right? There's tons of software support. The tooling is awesome. What is it like if I sit down now as a software engineering researcher with a data set that has, you know, all of this tool support in it? So, so you have the you had the slide with the spider eyes, so, mm -hmm. which is today's work practice still very hands-on, right? Mm -hmm still lots of discourse among the practitioners. Does it still look like that? Or if we crank up the tooling, does it somehow look different a couple of decades from now? Um, so first of all, I expect the tooling will come through much closer and much sooner than 50 years. Yeah, we're always optimistic in uh, software. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It may not change the world. Double that and increase all the magnitude. There we go. <laughs> it's going to be like six months. It'll be all here, right? <laughs> no. um, so I, I think it'll come in sooner than 50 years. Um, it's, there's a lot of stuff here that's not actually technically difficult. It's doing some piping and connecting. Uh, and then it's a matter of adding to that, making these things so you can keep on adding new visualizations, new machine learning algorithms, things like that, extending something like Sana. As far as what this means for the nature of research, well, that also depends upon what is the nature of software development. If we actually get these virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality things working well, then we might not be traveling around as much. We might be sitting here collaborating with people in Bothell and with people in London as if we're in the same room, perceiving them with the sufficient fidelity to have the affordances of the 
gestures and the gaze and the things like that through the holographic images. Yeah, that might be more than a few years out. But it's, this stuff is coming. There's going to be aspects of that coming. And so that changes the nature of work. Because if software developers can do that, well, so can other people. To look 50 years, I don't. I think I'm lucky if I can see a couple years. 50 years is way beyond where I can uh, speculate or extrapolate. Do you have ideas? Well, I'm, so I'm thinking, for example, by comparison to say the mining software repositories community, mm -hmm. right? So if you look back, say around the turn of the millennium, um, there, a lot of that community was doing handwork, right? Um, of the kind that ethnographers do today, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of handcrafting of data sets with a lot of cleaning by hand and so on, right? Right. Things have gotten much better now, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of tooling support. Right. So, so now if you have a new hypothesis, you have a new research question, it's not quite as easy as writing a SQL query over a giant database, but it's getting there, right? Bit by bit, right? So in a sense, I, I sense the trajectory there on, right? Where like eventually, it turns into like a small Python script or something, like testing a, a hypothesis, right? Here I'm trying to understand better what's it look like. It's, you know, answering a research question is probably not a SQL query, right? It's probably something more than that, right? Well, I think I, I can imagine it is a query. Where was that talk where Sochi was getting a question from Rob? Oh, here are some instances. Oh, okay, now, and then you recreate this environment and you're in it, and you can sit where you're sitting and see that, oh, you can't see this person up here who's doing this really annoying thing, or something like that. So I can imagine the ability to enter into the presence of the environment mm. could be quite different, and to be able to return to that again and again. One of the huge things about the video, use of video in ethnography, is that you can replay it again and again and again and again. You can share it with people, and they can come up to their own conclusion about whether they believe you or not. You've got that raw data. So if, if you had access to those repositories of the recordings, you could go and say, oh, I see something different. You could go sit over here and I'll look at what's going on. Or you didn't know what they were actually working on because you didn't actually go back enough, far enough in time, but I actually went far, far enough in time. And the reason they're doing these really stupid looking things is because the CEO said, came in and said, okay, for the next two weeks, we're gonna have to do this really stupid looking thing because of this constraint. It's like, oh, they weren't being stupid software developers. They were just doing what they had to do because of the world that they were in. But if you only collect a, a little bit of data, you can't go back and see those things that generate the context. I don't know if that answers your question. OK. Yes. So I'd like to propose an idea for how to get to 100 years out. Maybe from 50 years is not too far away. <laughs> But it feels like I'm well in, in the same in the similar ballpark of a lot of qualitative research is uh, a complaint about it is like, well, you talk to two people, how do you know that generalizes across a large variety of people? Let's say that you could put <laughs> these things in every team room of companies across North America, you know, and then are there tools that would enable you to compare two types of experiences of what does pair programming look like in Ottawa versus what it looks like in Mexico City? And does it look the same if we look yeah. at a lot of different sites? Right, if you had enough recordings and you could figure out the privacy settings so they wouldn't disturb people to keep this stuff, so maybe there's automatic ways to de or to anonymize the characteristics of the environment and the voice so that you can mm -hmm. still attend to the features that are important but not know who is speaking. And if you have enough, you can imagine that. Um, and the social, science communities have come up with ways to be really rigorous with this qualitative analysis where you have a small sample size and you're not using statistics. Yeah. Um, so those things, practices exist. And yes, if you had a large repository, you could say, wait, what was it like 20 years ago? What, where, oh, you're looking back, there was this pivot, this, this, um, this inflection point, it seems, in history. And then you can go investigate that. Or if you're in an organization and you recorded all your meetings this way, you can say, wait a minute, there was that discussion, where was that discussion? Because that was, I can't remember, but there's something really important said there. And then you could query for that and find that and re-listen to it and go, and hear it anew, hear it again in now your new context and understand what they're saying and go, oh, 
now I know why, or now I know where to go. So I can imagine that type of being able to jump around space and time to gather data sets that you can compare. And I personally think that any practice looks different in any context. That's a part of the practice. Other questions? Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Um, how do you even know what to collect? It, I, it seems like you mentioned a couple of times where you're looking at like chunks of what you've already recorded, and there and there's something that jumps at you, and that seems very interesting, and so on. So you isolate it. But how do you even start with what you set up to record? In the first so, two answers. One is I did a bunch of experiments. I visited this place. Uh, probably uh, 15 times before I went to the big data collection of 11 days, uh, or 10 times, something like that. And I went in there and I collected a little bit of data, and then I used it and realized, oop, this is limitation. So I collected more data. The second thing is that I'm interested in collaboration, but collaboration isn't controlled. I can't say, stop collaborating with that person. It goes where it wants to go. So in this sense, I needed to gather widely, and I basically got as wide a view as I could with the equipment I had available and the time I had available so that I could then follow the work around there. It's a very different way of thinking about research than the classic way where you say, this is what I'm going to study, and this is the data. So the single question, and then you right. go and collect what's relevant. I start off with a single collection. What's the behavior of sketching? How does sketching afford the collaboration? And they have all these whiteboards in the organization. And I went there, and went, in the first day, I realized, oh, there's a lot of sketches and a lot of whiteboards, but they only actually spend about half an hour a week sketching. So I would not have time to actually get enough data to do anything interesting. So the, my assumption about what was going on was wrong. And that was another motivation. I want to gather more widely to give me safety. So when I collect the data, I can get something useful out of it. Thank you for putting the tiny thumbnail of the spider on your scalability slide, too, because I'm terrified of spiders, so you that would freak me out. It. Thank you. Yeah. I'll make it smaller. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. That's good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks.